Welcome to the Salvation Army Barry Citadel this Sunday morning, August the 30th. We are so happy that we're able to continue to worship together via the medium of technology. I just want to say first off, please continue to reach out to each other via email, via phone, any other method, uh, maintaining social distancing but just continue to reach out to one another. You guys have done such a fantastic job over these last months in raising each other's spirits and just continuing to reach out and encouraging one another. So I would like to encourage you to keep doing that because you're doing a fantastic job. If you are new to our live stream, we'd like to welcome you. We would love to get to know you better. So at your convenience, please send us an email at sabarry at telezon.ca so we can connect with you further. As usual, please continue to tune in to our daily devotional thoughts on our Facebook page as well as our YouTube channel. Uh, in some core family news to share with you this week, David Hicks as well as Selby Cooper both had surgery this week and both surgeries went well. Please continue to pray for them as they recuperate. Many of you will also know from an email that was sent out earlier this week 
that June Armstrong has passed away this past Sunday, August the 23rd. Will you please continue to lift up the family in your prayers during this difficult time? For those of you who are looking to give your tithe, you can do so in uh, one of four methods. You can give your tithe via our website, which is www.barrysalvationarmy.org and click the tithe slash donate link. You can also mail your checks to the Salvation Army Barry Citadel. Another method is you can tithe via pre-authorized payments. If you would like to set this up, all you have to do is send Jim Willis an email and he will be happy to set you up in that method. Finally, you can also drop off your tithe at the core on Tuesdays and Friday mornings from 8.30 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. Please note that this is a no contact drop off method. I was reading this morning in Psalm 103 verse 1 where it says, Let all that I am praise the Lord. With my whole heart I will praise his holy name. So let's do that today. Let's praise the Lord with all that we are. Let's praise him with our whole hearts. And let's start that off as we begin our service with our call to worship. Please join me in reading this morning's call to worship taken from Psalm 91 verses 14 to 16. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him, for he acknowledges my name. He will call on me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Amen. May God add a blessing to the reading of his word. Let's all join and sing together our opening song for this Sunday morning, I Believe That God the Father.
let's all join and sing together our next song, Jesus Messiah. Hey kids, and all you much, much, much older kids, let's all listen to today's Children's Time message from Major Sandy and Bramwell. 
Hi kids, Bramwell's back again, aren't you? Today we're going to talk about the chickens. Good! You did not chase the chickens. I'm really pleased to hear that. Oh, I see. Bramwell says the rooster encouraged him not to chase the chickens. He chased you. Okay, I understand. Well, what did you learn from the chickens? You didn't learn very much from the little chicks. No. But you did learn something from the mother hen. Okay, tell us what you learned. I do know what a hawk is. Do you know what a hawk is, kids? a big bird and it likes to eat little animals, right? Like mice and chipmunks and especially little chicks. Okay, all right. And a fence doesn't keep the hawks away. Oh, I understand that because they fly, right? Okay, so what happened at the farm? Alright, one morning there was a hawk in the sky. Yeah? Really? And he was just flying around in circles. He was looking for breakfast. Okay. Oh, and the mother hen saw him. And what did she do? She clucked. And all her little chicks came running towards her. Yeah, okay. And then what happened? Really? Yeah, Bramwell says she lifted her wings and all the chickens went underneath her wings. Oh, and she fluffed her feathers up so she looked really big. And then she just watched the hawk. I understand. Bramwell says the hawk wasn't going to attack the hen because she was too big, right? I think you're right. If the hawk had attacked her, she might have got hurt. Oh, but she protected all of the chicks. Yeah, under her wings. Have I ever heard of that before? Actually, I have. <laughs> right, in the Bible. Jesus once said to the people in Jerusalem, how often I would have gathered you as a hen gathers her chicks. That's right. He wanted to come, them to come to him so that they would be safe. But you know what the saddest part of that verse is? Yeah. Jesus said, but you would not. Oh, the mother hen on your farm has taught her chicks to come when she calls. That's a good thing, right? She can protect them then. And you know what? It's good for us to remember that Jesus wants to keep us safe, just like a mother hen. He can help us when there's a problem in our lives or something that's going to hurt us. If we come to him, if we talk to him in prayer, if we stay close to him, and do what he tells us to do, he can help to keep us safe. And when we're having a hard day, it's really nice to think about hiding under his wings, just like those little chicks did. Yeah, it's nice and warm under her wings, isn't it? Yeah, and safe. And God wants us to be close to him because he wants to keep us safe as well. So, when you're feeling kind of alone or frightened, why don't you think about the fact 
that you can hide close to Jesus just as the chicks hid under the wings of their mother hen. Right. Okay. Good story. Thank you. Next week, you're going to talk about a really small creature on the farm. Okay. Oh, a scary creature. Well, we'll see what you have to say about that next week. Do you want to blow the kids a kiss? Here we go. Good job. And now we'll see you next week, kids. Let's pause now and take a few minutes to quietly reflect on today's offertory, All That I Have, presented by Sandy Patton. Let's listen now as the band brings us encouragement through their selection, Oh How I Love Jesus.
Reading from Luke, chapter 14, verses 16 through 24. Jesus said to him, A man gave a big dinner. He invited many people. When it was time to eat, he sent his servant to tell the guests, Come, the food is ready. But all of the guests said that they could not come. Each one made an excuse. The first one said, I have just bought a field, so I must go and look at it. Please excuse me. Another man said, I have just bought five pairs of work animals, oxen. I must go and try them out. Please excuse me. A third man said, I just got married. I can't come. So the servant returned and told his master what happened. The master was angry. He said, hurry, go into the streets and alleys of the town. Bring me the poor, the crippled, the blind, the lame. Later the servant said to him, Master, I did what you told me to do, but we still have places for more people. The master said to the servant, go out into the highways and country roads. Tell the people there to come. I want my house to be full. I tell you, not one of these people I invited first will eat any of the food that I have prepared. Thanks to Jim for the Bible reading this morning. I've entitled my message, The Great Banquet. That's the title in the Bible. I want to use that title. Uh, title here. When a feast was given, it was a tradition that you would invite guests and you would get RSVPs from them so that the host would know how many to prepare for. It's interesting, I just got a wedding invitation and it's the same, isn't it? Will you be there? How many in the party? How many are coming? So when the dinner was ready, and Jim read this, it's no shock that this is happening. This is a feast that is prepared. It'd be sent out wide, telling them, come now, as promised, this is the time, come. Some of us don't need to feel this or hear this because we felt it, haven't we? Having a, maybe it's a Super Bowl party or some other kind of party that you've invited your friends and then they just don't show up. You've planned for months and months, and nobody comes. It's hurt. It's, it's hurtful. It's inconvenient. But in these times, people lived for feasts. It was a big deal. And they were treated like a big deal. The who's who were invited. I think of it maybe as a royal wedding that we think of, you know, uh, when uh, Meghan Markle and Prince Harry got married, the, the, the lavish invitations that would have gone out to the duchesses and dukes and the leaders around the world that had gone to this event. There had been a great amount of money that would have been spent on the best wine, the best food. The appropriate number of animals would be sacrificed to feed the expected crowd. So we can understand why a host would be angry if a large number of the guests just responded positively to the initial invitation and they just decided at the last minute they weren't coming. Actually, there was one commentator that I read that said such a move in an Arab world would constitute a declaration of war. Something to keep in mind as we go through this story. Let's look first at the excuses that were offered. The first one says, I've just purchased a piece of land and I have to go and look at it. Well, feasts in those days were held at nighttime usually. Who's going into a dark field at night to look at your property? It's not like you've got your flashlight or your miner's hat light and you can go out and look. It's pitch black. Who's going to look in the dark at a piece of property. 
It's as if the man had already decided a great deal of time, a great deal of time ago that he wasn't coming. He just wasn't going to make the effort. Basically, what he's saying is, I've changed my mind. I'd rather do almost anything else than go to your feast. I think maybe today it's, oh, I think I'd rather sort my sock drawer, or I'd rather watch paint dry than go to your feast. Excuse number two, the men had bought five yoke of oxen. For me, that's ten oxen. A large purchase, a big financial burden, actually. It indicates that this guy is very wealthy off or is pretty well off financially at least, in order to buy 10 animals all at one time. Well, when is the last time you heard of somebody buying a new car without test driving it? He'd already tested the oxen. He had already done the things that he needed to do. So let's assume that maybe he had sent somebody else to make the deal for him. Well, if that's the case, he never has to harness himself to the plow either. He'd have someone else do that. Even if he's the one that owns the oxen, sure they would be safe and warm and fed for a few hours in the barn while he goes and celebrates. Lame excuse. Excuse number three, I've married a wife. Okay, considering the culture, the wife probably wasn't invited anyway, just the man. But if he just got married, then he must have accepted the first invitation to the feast prior to the wedding. And unless it was a shotgun wedding, and they didn't have shotguns back then, he would have known well in advance about the, the banquet before responding to the invitation. So either this guy is a big social bungler or he's just rude and insulting and deserves to be object of the host's anger. So where's Jesus going with this, you're asking? Well, in order to get to the picture, we really should go back to verse 15. Jesus is at the home of a leading Pharisee. And as usual, there's a large gathering, all wanting to scrutinize Jesus. He heals a man with dropsy, which they don't approve of because it's the Sabbath. And healing is considered work. I know that we've had this conversation over and over, the absurdity of how healing a man can be a bad thing. But Jesus gives them a verbal teaching about humility and finishes with a verse most of us are familiar with. For everyone who exalts himself shall be humbled, and he who humbles himself shall be exalted. A very appropriate declaration from the mouth of the very one who humbled himself on a cross so that we could have eternal life. He then goes on addressing directly to the man who had invited him to dinner and tells him that the blessings to be revealed at the resurrection will be those who are good and those who are unable to repay, not to those who only serve those who could offer nothing in return. The prevailing assumption, of course, among the Jews of Jesus' day was that the Messiah came he would set up his kingdom here on earth. He then goes on addressing himself to the man who had invited him to dinner and tells him that the blessings to be revealed at the resurrection will be those who were good and kind to those who were unable to repay, not to those who only serve those who could not serve in return. The men Jesus is talking to represented the Jews as a nation who had accepted the first invitation in the sense that they received the law and the prophets. And they were diligent to keep the letter of the law, watching for the coming of the Messiah as they perceived him to be. But they were to reject the second invitation, the servant of God, our Lord Jesus Christ. 
It says in John 7, 37, and they are therefore rejected by the angry and offended host, just as the Jewish nation was set aside by the Father and his invitation for salvation was sent out to others. Seems to be two sets of people that are invited, doesn't it? In verse 21, he says, Go to the streets, to the lanes of the city, and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Luke 7, 22 said, And he answered them, he said, Go and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised, the poor have the gospel preached to them. These are the people that the Pharisees had seen as undesirables. Shut them out of the kingdom of God. So now they're invited to the feast. And we're responding. But in verse 22, the servant says to the master, there's still much more room. There's room for everyone. And the master sends it outside one more time to the city, to the highways, into the hedges, to the homeless people. They have no shelter at all to come to the feast. In their case, it's not an invitation. He says, compel them to come. There's a sense of urgency, perhaps an inherent warning to avoid the folly of the first group of guests that were invited that had excuses. Of course, this is a reference to the Gentiles who did not come under the shelter of the house of Israel, who did not have the law and the prophets, who were outside the commonwealth of Israel. It's Paul that writes to the church in Ephesus. Remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you were formerly were far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. What should excite joy in us, Christians, and fill us with wonder and gratitude that we serve such a loving God that nobody is excluded in his kingdom? It's this very reason that it should strike at us that the homeowner is representing God the Father who desires us and desires a relationship with us. Think about it. I desire that my house is filled. God reaching out to us, not us reaching out to God. Oh, how I love Jesus was what the band played earlier. Why? Because he first loved me. What a simple course. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me. I want my house full. I want to be in a relationship with my people. That's what God is saying. God knows that they're his. And he calls them. And he calls them in. Into this invitation. Into this Relationship. Last week we talked about this eternal relationship. This is what this is about. Even when he criticized the attitudes and actions of the Pharisees and the scribes, inherited to the words of warning, they are given an invitation. It wasn't too late for them. And even knowing their hearts and their choices that they would make, it wasn't too late for them. So how is it ever too late for us? If only they could see with the eyes that Jesus sees. As the world grows more and more afraid, to be clearly and singularly identified with a particular cause or creed that might be offensive to those others of a different mindset. The church needs to run sharply from the path 
and take up the cross of Christ and know it's leading again. We talk so much about reaching out to the lost and partnering in ministry with other people to reach out to the unchurched and bring them in. Maybe we need to be concerned about the ones that have already come in that have never tasted the great banquet. Maybe our traditional evangelical methods aren't working. Maybe we need to compel the unchurched. We have to have a fervor, a desire, a heart. In the Great Commission in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus doesn't go out and say to make members to his church. He says, go and make disciples of all nations. Sometimes we think it's about us. It's got nothing to do with us. It's got to do with those that don't know Jesus. A lot of the polls that I've read over the last little while about reaching unchurched people is that church people don't talk to unchurched people. Well, how do they know Jesus if we don't tell them? How will they ever know his love if we don't show them? Well, that's your job, Captain. That's what we want you to do. Well, I don't know your neighbor. My first appointment, I, had a, I was doing the, uh, the roles, and, and my court treasurer said to me, uh, the name came up, and I said, well, who's this guy? And he said, that's my neighbor. I said, oh, well, why doesn't he come to church anymore? He said, I don't know. I said, how long has he been your neighbor? 15 years, and you've never talked to him about it? Well, that's your job, Captain. It's not my job. It's our job, collectively, to invite into the banquet, into the relationship with Jesus Christ. If for any reason you're one of those that are out on the highways and the hedges and you've never responded to God's call in your life, today's the day. Today is that day. If you've never responded, if you've heard maybe hundreds and thousands of sermons and you've never responded, today's the day. Come to the banquet. There's a seat for you. There's a seat waiting for you. The invitation was made at Calvary, and there's a seat waiting for you. In 1987 to 1989, the session of officers in the Salvation Army were called ambassadors of Christ. And that's what we're all called to be, ambassadors for Christ. If you don't know Jesus, today's the day. John Gowans, in our songbook, wrote a song called, They Need Christ. And it goes through different stages of people's lives. But it's in the fourth verse. There are one of ways who want a place to go. They need you, they need me, they need Christ. They're alcoholics that don't seem to know. They need you, they need me, they need Christ. There are godless people who have lost their way and they need God's love, but they're afraid to say. And this is the line. If we close our eyes, perhaps they'll go away. Without you, without me, without Christ. If we close our eyes, they never come to the banquet. They never get the invitation. God is calling us into a new relationship. I believe that through this whole pandemic that God is giving us a restart. A chance to be the church. And if we don't seize those opportunities then they'll go away without you, without me, without Christ. Let's sing this song together.
our closing song, all have need of God's salvation. If with him they'd live forever, but a promise has been given. It's written. Whosoever. Let's sing together, friends. sung benediction. Lord, if your presence does not stay with us, have a great week, friends. They need you. They need me. They need Christ. <laughs>